So it's important from time to time to talk about ways that you as a web application developer have a responsibility to create secure web applications. And so I want to call your attention to places where you write code that seems like on the surface that it's what's what could go wrong and then you realize, oh, wait a sec, that could go wrong. So it turns out that you, you take data from the user in the request object, whether it's from a form or from the URL, and, you know, like guess equals 42, seems innocuous enough. And then what I did is I just concatenated that into HTML and I sent that back. And so the problem is, is what if somebody with ill intent uh, tries to produce data that actually does something? And the problem is, is if I take data straight from the user and put it back in the HTML response, well, HTML and JavaScript are programming language. Your, your browser is being programmed, and that means that a user typing data into your system can program the browser. And what's even worse is that, I mean, having them program their own browser, not such a big deal. Um, but in a way, the, what they do is they put some data in your system that turns into code, and then they kidnap someone else's browser when they take a look at data that came in. This is called cross-site scripting, where in a, in a sense what, what it's doing is it's trying to run code so that it can read stuff from your site and then hand it to a rogue site. And so we have to protect against this. And it's a very simple thing. So if we take a look at the code that was bad, basically we have this parameter guess. And in the last time I showed you, that was 42. And we just took this request get guess, which is this stuff, and we simply concatenated it into some HTML. Well, if I carefully construct my guess with percent %c3, blah, 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 all the blah, 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 all that stuff, well, that turns into, this is a URL encoding of less than, be bold, greater than, bold, slash, so that turns into HTML. So I passed into this application some HTML, and I, I, as the developer, took that and I concatenated it together, so the response source has HTML. It's HTML that mostly comes from the application, but this little bit of HTML came from the person who put it in. And like I said, it's not such a critical problem if I, in my browser, put stuff to take over your browser but it is if, if someone, you can move that into someone else's browser. So what happens is, is that the, the, the browser sees this bold text in HTML, and instead of showing us the less than and the greater than, it actually shows it to us as bold. Now this seems innocuous enough until you do something much more clever. And that is, I am going to carefully construct some code. JavaScript. And so what happens is, is this here is encoding of that line right there, the script alert owned slash script. And so what happens is, is that came in and it was concatenated straight out. And if you run this page, you won't see the data, but the actually JavaScript will run and it's going to show up an alert box that says owned and OK. Now, you can go ahead and look at the Wikipedia entries on cross-site scripting. Generally, the idea is, is once you're in JavaScript, you don't just say alert that I've owned your browser. What you do is you do something like grab a cookie and send it to a third party, or you call, say, a web service on the, on the system with a cookie and, uh, and do bad things. Like you can convince a teacher to log in and change someone else's grade or delete all the grades in a class. Um, once you're into a person's job, browser in JavaScript, you can do a lot. So that's really quite scary. And there's all kinds of scenarios where you're taking data from the user and you got to be careful because, yes, I said the guess is supposed to be a number, but if it's not a number, if I concatenate it without escaping it, it's a problem. So here is a safer version of that. So I've got another uh, view function called game, and it takes that same request and it still pulls that get data off, which is this bit right here, but then it calls a function, and that's Django utils HTML escape, 
right? So what that does is that be, that concatenates that into the HTML, but escape processes any dangerous characters and turns them into what are called HTML entities. So less than becomes ampersand LT. Greater than becomes ampersand GT. Right? These two, these four things with ampersands are a safer version of it. And so that means that even though I tried, I put in the data for bold, it comes out with the less thans and greater than showing, and it's not actually interpreted. Right? So this whole notion of escaping or HTML entities, converting data, running the data from a user through an HTML entity's automatic filter ensures that the user cannot provide you data that turns into code in their or someone else's browser eventually. So that's the kind of thing you have to think of as you're concatenating stuff together. That, and, and the key thing is, is the request get guess, that came from the user. And so we think the user's going to be nice, but a, 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 or a user with bad intent can send data that they carefully construct to cause the maximum trouble. But if you just escape your data before you concatenate it, there's nothing they can do about it. So another of the views is um, where we're gonna parse the parameter off of the URL itself. Uh, these URLs are a little prettier sometimes than the question mark keyword equals value. And so, uh, so let's take a look at this. The way you do this is you, in your URL patterns, you have a path, and instead of just having the path name, the, the view function name, um, you actually have this bracket, int colon bracket, uh, guess bracket. And what that is, and you can go look this up in the Django documentation, there's a whole series of these things. That says the parameter after the word rest is an integer, and please pass it in as the parameter guess. So I've given, I've chosen the name to pass it in as a parameter, and then once Django sees this, it pulls that 41 off and hands it to us. So we don't have to tear the URL apart. Actually, in this request object, we do get the URL. We could do a bunch of splits and fool around, but nah, it doesn't matter. Let's let Django do all that work. Let's just tell it we want that parameter after the word rest. It's supposed to be an integer and pass it to me in the variable guest, uh, in the variable guess. And then that same 41 comes in. I am cleverly escaping it before I concatenate it. And then I return a text-based HTML response with some HTML to back to the browser. So I'm this escape is there just because of cross-site scripting. I don't, I'm still taking this value, still coming from the user. So if any value comes from the user, you have to properly escape it before you show it to them. Now, those are all function-based, which are sort of a lower level. Um, we haven't got to the point where we're talking about forms, but eventually in that in those lower level functions, you have to check whether you got get a get request or a post request. Post request often comes from forms. And so, so this, cla this uh, class based view allows us to give a method for get and a method for post and let Django pick whether it's a get or a post. Um, and, and this is an object orient an object, and if you're a little rusty on objects, I've got a URL there on pythonforeverybody.com to review just like what a self is. I'm not gonna cover all that. Um, in the path command, um, you just have a you know a string that comes after the application, routing to this. The main view, as view is something you gotta add to it because main view is a class, not a function, but as view is a function. And then we have to create a method get. Self, of course, is just part of Python's object-oriented work. Request is that first parameter, right? And so this is this one here is just a stock response. And I, just like the other ones, I return an HTTP response. Now this, it's like, why, this looks a little more complex than the other one, did the same thing. But it turns out there is tons of things that we can do. And inheritance, the fact it's a class, there are so many things about object training programming that over the next few lectures we're going to really take advantage of this and we ultimately will rarely write the old school function based view, we'll do class based views. And so we can also pass parameters to class based views just like we can pass them to function based views. You say okay with a prefix of remain, slug is a 
kind of string and then guesses the parameter so that says pull this pull the string after the word remain off right views is the name of the view remain is the view within the application and then this third parameter is the guess and it's automatically parsed and handed to us in guess and then we're going to respond to a get request self of course is the object oriented thing here's the whole request and guess is that little piece that comes off of the end of the URL we're going to create a response by escaping the user provided guess bit so that if the user puts something nasty in for cross-site scripting haha ha, we uh, stop them from doing that and so that produces uh, the same kind of output your guess was ABC 123 42 XY ZZY so talking about return values um, everything we've shown you up till now is your basic 200 OK which means you ask for a page I gave you a page um, you're probably familiar with 404 not found which means you ask for a page that page doesn't exist there is another kind of response that's not actually a page which is a response header that says you know what it's not like you made a mistake but you're at the wrong place and it's we call it a redirect and 302 means I know where you're supposed to be and it isn't here and it was originally used for uh, sites that would move and it's all handled by the re, uh, uh, location header on the HTTP response and so we send a redirect response which is a 302 with the location header being set and it uses our URL and when the browser gets that you gets that HD uh, the 302 and a location header it, it doesn't show you what it just got but it immediately re, re gets that URL and then shows you that URL and the original idea was that um, if you renamed a domain or something you wanted to have the old domain redirect web browsers and search engines you use these 302s there's also a 301 uh, header that can be used to redirect all this stuff uh, but now we use it for all kinds of things and it's very much a controller function if you go to model view controller controller says okay we're done with that but I want your browser to go over there so that like that that routing that sort of routing the browser changing the browser putting the browser where you want it to be that's part of the applications controller phase so we can send a redirect from a from a, a Django view and so here we go if you go to this bounce it's going to actually not end up at this it's going to bounce it to somewhere else and in the path we just say if we go to the bounce view run to this function this is not a class based function this is an old school function and so the request data is passed in and instead of now returning an HTTP response which we would put in here HTML we're doing an HTTP response redirect and now we put a URL and what we're saying with this whole thing is you're at the wrong place please browser when you get this response back go here so it's like it bounces to the browser and then bounces back and then reads that URL so and and you don't you can have some output but folks generally don't need output when you're doing a redirect so if you take a look at that bounce watching it in your network console in a JavaScript debugger what you see is you see a set of three requests actually just two you'll see the first request is going to bounce and if we take a look at the, this request we see that it, it's a 302 it's kind of small you see we got a 302 which tells the browser something's wrong I'm not at the right place and then also the server sends the location header that says this is where you're supposed to be and the browser immediately turns around and does a, a get to that URL simple.htm and then that's what we see and then this 404 interestingly the three statuses I talked to you about is because at this new location djfree.com slash simple.htm there's no favicon remember the favicon is the thing that shows up like right there in the in the top tab bar is the favicon and I don't have a favicon at least not now for DJ free I should put a favicon there but we get to see a 404 and all that means is the browser looked for a favicon and didn't find it so we see a 302 which is moved with a location header and then we see a, a get which returns then a 200 which is a success and we see the document and then we see a 404 because it tries to grab the favicon and so the HTML you get back from 
djfree.com simple.htm, that's this simple page with a, with a simple link. Okay, so that's how the redirect works. So that's a series of views, both the input, class base, function base, and to both the, the HTTP response and the HTTP redirect response. So up now, come up next, we're going to talk about how building templates makes us do a lot less concatenation.